Also vielen Dank. Wir legen los. Der erste Coach, Jeff Reinwald, kommt durch die Mitte. Catwalk. Ist äh, Special Team Coach bei den Hamilton Tigers, ist schon 30 Jahre im äh, Footballgeschäft tätig, hat alles erlebt, kennt alles und ich habe die letzten drei Monate genossen, ihn auf Sky moderieren zu sehen. Da hat, hat man Football verstanden und das wird auch, heute auch für uns hier machen. Vielen Dank. Dankeschön. Entschuldigung, mein Deutsch ist sehr scheiß, so Englisch bitte, okay? Uh, Martin asked me to come, and I was I jumped at the opportunity. As you just listened to, I, I go I coach in the Canadian Football League. I coach for the oldest pro football team in the world, the Hamilton Tiger Cats, 15 champ 15 times CFL champions. We just played our 101st championship game in Canada, so we're extremely proud of that I represent those things. But when he called me, I said, Martin. I'm going to be in, I should be in England, and then I'm going to go do the Super Bowl. So I flew back to Toronto, spent three days in the office, got on an airplane and flew here, and I'll fly back Sunday because free agency starts next week in our league. But I wanted to do this because some of the best experiences I've had in coaching happened in this country. Some of the best lessons I learned in coaching happened because of players and coaches in this country. One of the most proud moments in my life as a football coach was to stand on the sidelines in 1999, I'm sorry, and be a member of the German national coaching staff. And some of you guys are in this room were with us when we did that. That's something that was totally unique in my experience. In the United States, now it's changed. There is a national team. Kind of, right? I go to, I, every spring I go to American Samoa with a group of NFL guys and we do outreach work to the football players and coaches in, in Samoa. And we started a national champ, or excuse me, a national team in Samoa. And I was sitting there with Jesse Cipolo who has three Super Bowl rings from the San Francisco 49ers. And I said, Jesse, you know what's amazing about this? Young kids in this country now, in, in Samoa, We'll have a chance to do something, even though you've won three championships in the, in, in the Super Bowl, you'll, you'll never have an opportunity to represent your country and these young Samoan kids will. So I encourage you to support the national teams. The national team experience to me was a phenomenal, phenomenal thing. And like I said, I've been to championships, been to BCS bowl games, done all those wonderful things, but having an opportunity to coach on the German national team was a tremendous honor for me. All right now. This first half hour that we're going to spend together, and I want to lay down some kind of rules for while I'm here. I am here for you. You are not here for me. And I made this, I think, clear to Martin. I want you to take advantage of this time that we have together. Do not be shy. Do not be English word reticent. I don't know what it is in Deutsch. But I encourage you, I brought all of our game tape from last year. I've got cut-ups on everything you can imagine in football. Use those things. Take them. I'll allow you to, the, some of the stuff I can't because it belongs to the, to the club, but I will give you anything that I have. It's not mine. It was something that was passed to me to pass on to the next generation. The half hour we're going to spend this morning will probably be, in my opinion, as I, I didn't understand it as a young coach, and now at 56 years old, I understand it much better. The, this half hour is about things that are way more important, way more important than scheme, than about how you get this player to block that player, or how you beat this defense, or how you beat this coverage. These things are the essence of the game. They're why we do what we do, all right? And the reality of it is, guys, that at the professional level, I have the same job you have. No matter whether you're coaching Yukon, whether you're in the first division, the fourth division, it doesn't matter because the game is the same game. The athletes that play it are different. 
They're bigger, they're faster, they're more get all of that stuff, but that doesn't make them better. And it doesn't make me better, or it doesn't work that way. We all coach the same game. When I coach Nami, I coach them just like I coach my guys to this day. There's, there's a way to do this thing, and it's really critical because our game is under attack. There are people that are trying to get rid of football. I'm just telling you the truth. We have to take care of our game. All right, so let's, we're going to go through this, and again, bear with me because I'm not a very good technical guy. But as we go through it, we're going to talk about this. What is the role of the coach at all levels? First thing I'm going to ask each of you to do while you're here. So you don't have to, you don't keep it to yourself, but write it down. Ask yourself, why do I coach? Why do I coach? What is it that puts me out there to work with those young kids? Ask yourself that. And, and you really have to search inside your heart and, and try and find out what it is that, that makes you do that. What I'm hopeful that you'll see is, and, and, it, and it, comes in, it comes in growth, I think. Because I'll be honest with you, when I started, it wasn't for the right reasons. It's because I had just finished playing and I loved the game and I didn't know what else to do. But I wasn't coaching for the players. And as I've gotten older, I've found out that it's all about the players. It's all about the kids. Whether that kid is a 27-year-old guy that's a 9-year pro, or whether he's a 17-year-old kid that, that's played the game for 9 months, it's all about the players. It has to be, because it's their game. We are entrusted with helping them learn to enjoy and play the game at its highest level. Now, we're going to use that term all the time when we speak, the highest level. Okay? And that's not a slippery term, but each, each program, each player, each coach has, its own, has their own highest level. It's up to us to find what it is for us. All right? but we're going to talk about our role, first of all, because that's most important. You can't coach if you don't know what your job is. First thing, you have to create an environment where a player can be at his best on a daily basis. It's amazing. Absolutely incredible. I go to Pete Carroll's press conference at the Super Bowl. And what he talked about more than anything else was the type of environment they create in Seattle. The, the, the player development director in Seattle was the guy that played for me for six years in three different places in pro football, Maurice Kelly, and he said the same thing. He said, Jeff, we don't run any secret plays. We don't have a system that's better than everybody else in the, 30, in the 31 other NFL teams. But what we have in Seattle is an environment where every player in Seattle can come to practice every day and be the best player he's capable of being. And that is the responsibility and the role of every single person in the organization. Not just Pete Carroll, but all the way down to the guy who cleans the lockers, to the, to the weight room attendants, to everybody that touches their program. Everybody has the same job. Create an environment where a player can be his best on a daily basis. That takes inventory. All of these things require that you sit and think about these things. What did I do today? At the end of your practice, when you, when you go home or when you meet as a coaching staff, whatever, what did I do today to help foster an environment where every player that comes on my field, whether he's this big, this big, whether he's playing for the first time or whether he's getting paid to play, what did I do to help that player become the best player he's capable of being? We service the players. The players do not service us. Right? That's the first thing. Secondly, we have to teach the fundamentals of the game safely. Here's the reality of our game. It is different than tennis. It's different than soccer. It's different than hockey. It's different than baseball. It's different than basketball. It's different than every other sport. It's a violent, dangerous game. That's the reality of it. That's one of the reasons why a lot of us fell in love with it. But because it is that game, we have a very major responsibility to make sure that the players are safe. And that every fundamental and every technique and every drill that we teach never puts a player at risk. 
When you're a young coach and I made the mistake, so I'm, again, I'm criticizing me. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at me. When you're a young coach, the first thing you want to do is see how hard you can slam them together. How much contact can you have? Fellas, that's not the answer. That's not the answer. I watched my son's team. He's a high school player in Canada. They're playing for the city championship against the team that they had beaten previously. Now, I would never, and I will never step in to the coach, to the, his coaches. That's their deal. But I watched them the night before they played the championship game. The defensive coordinator get upset with his defensive players and start to scream at the defensive players that I want offensive players on the ground in their team period. They lost their starting tackle and they lost the starting receiver in that team period. They now, because they had no depth, because Canadian football, high school football is much like youth football in Europe, they had no depth, they have to take a wide receiver and start to tackle the next day, they lose the city championship. Those kids will never get that opportunity again. And frankly, they lost the game because the coach's ego was so big. Right? So I'm just using that as a point. We have a responsibility to teach the fundamentals of the game safely. I think in Europe, they, you guys do a much better job, particularly in Germany, you do a much better job with the licensing and all the coach education that you got. But again, check yourself. Life is a series of checks and tests. I know for sure because four years ago I had a doctor come, I went to the doctor because I'd been surfing in a wife, had this little thing on my stomach and I couldn't figure out what it was. We finished recruiting, I went, I always get a physical after recruiting, I go in and see the doctor, he said, I don't like the looks at it, they buy out, I got cancer. So I've learned from that experience that life is nothing more but a, than a series of checks and tests. Right? And I've learned that I have to check myself on a daily basis. And that's one of the things I have to make sure I do. I create a culture of mutual respect on the football team. Share the responsibility of each coach on the staff. Guys, I'm telling you right now, you're going to get great football information here at this clinic. I know some of these clinicians. Guys are going to speak, talk to you, speak to you. They're going to give you some great X and O stuff. But it comes down to this, again, a culture of mutual respect on the football team is a shared responsibility of every coach on the staff. Every coach on the staff has to share that in that responsibility. What's the culture of mutual respect? Well, mutual respect carries a lot of ground. It's how we communicate with one another. It's how we practice together. It's all of those things because I've never one time seen a great team that was a poor practice team. And you can't be a good practice team if you don't respect one another. All right? So again, that's another area where we've got to look at. Now, let's talk about creating a winning culture. These are the things that I have found over time. I right? 32 years in this doing this. 20 of them on a professional level. These are the things that I have found, and they were passed to me. And I am passing them to you. What you do with them is your own business. But they were passed to me by a man who's way smarter than me, who's won a lot more football games than me. This guy right here. Does anybody know who that is? If you do, raise your hand. Who is it? Dick Vermeil. Dick Vermeil. Won a Pac-8, it was called the Pac-8 in those kind of those days. Pac-8 championship at UCLA, beat an, under, beat an undefeated Ohio State team in the Rose Bowl, team that was supposed to be unbeatable with a bunch of scrawny guys from UCLA. He went to the Philadelphia Eagles, a team that had not been to the NFL playoffs in 23 years. Five years later, they're playing in the Super Bowl. He retires, he has a, he has a nervous breakdown and retires, leaves football for 13 years, goes back to the St. Louis Rams. Three years later, they're in the Super Bowl and win it. Took the Kansas City Chiefs to the playoffs every year, every year was in Kansas City before retiring. He is my mentor. He is the one who's given me more than I, I could ever give anybody else. I asked him to come coach with me one time when I was very young and stupid and didn't realize you didn't ask guys like this to do these things. I was coaching at Rocky Mountain College, which is the lowest level of college football available. The bottom of the food chain. We didn't have enough players to have an inter-squad game in the spring. 
There were three footballs. One of them had air in it. That's how bad this was. And I asked Coach Vermeule to come coach with us. And I said, I can't pay you, but I can take you to try. He loves the trout because I can take the best trout fishing in Montana. He came and spent six days with us, and that six days was a formative time in my career because I was young and I was stupid and I was full of myself. And he showed me a better way. Right? So we're going to talk about these things. These are directly from him. He gave them to me on the day that I was taken into the airport. He said, pull over, Jeff. I pulled over on the way to the airport. He said, I'm going to send something to you that means much more to you now than it means to me. I had no idea what he's talking about. Three days later, the lady from the mail thing, the campus mail called. She said, there's a package for you. I said, please send it down. She said, I can't. It's too big. I said, too big? She said, yeah, it's some big box. I said, where's it from? She said, it's from Philadelphia. I knew who, who had sent it. I had no idea what was in it. Brought it down, put it in my office, opened it, and boxed this off. It was every playbook, every note, every meeting tape that Coach Romeo had assembled over his 40 years of coaching at that time. So I read every single piece of it. And as I read it, I got tears in my eyes because I realized how far away from being, how far away from understanding I really was about what really mattered in coaching. All right, so we're going to talk about how we create. And this doesn't matter if you're in at the 17th division, these things are true. Why? Because who, what do we coach? We coach human beings. It's a player's game, a people's game, a human being's game. It's not X's and O's. Right? And these things transcend every level of football. I, would use, I watched him use them in the National Football League with him, and I've, I've seen it work with Team Europe, which is youth age kids. Right? So let's look at these things. Take them with you and use them to help your program. This is how you create a winning coach. Number one, players don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Think about that statement. They don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. If they don't think you care for them as a human being, and you genuinely care for them as a human being, they're never going to play as well as they're capable of playing because they won't give themselves to you that much. So, first thing, first way to improve your team, care about them. Love them. Now, that's a strange word for all of us macho guys in football and macho girls in football to talk about. But we, we talk about it openly on our team. I talk about it openly with our players. I love you. Not in a romantic sense. I love you because you committed to something really hard and we did it together. We fought together through it. And that creates a bond that never goes away. Ask Donald. Yes, it's okay. <laughs> you must reach before you can teach. Very much the same thing. Guys, I have been around all different kinds of coaches in all these years. And I've been around some brilliant guys. I'm talking about brilliant guys that had no business being in football. They should have been splitting the atom or doing brain surgery or finding peace in the Middle East. That's how smart they were. But I've seen very many of those same guys that couldn't, couldn't maximize a player's potential because they couldn't reach the kid. Because to them, it wasn't about the kid. It was about the scheme. I'm telling you, players don't, I'm mean, me, scheme does not win what players do. Right? I watched the Seattle Seahawks totally dominate the Super Bowl. Totally dominate the, historically the, the number one offense in the history of professional football. Nobody had done what Denver had done going into that game. And I watched that defense go out there and play two coverages, two, me, two fronts, and four coverages. Two fronts, four coverages. One blitz the entire day and beat the living dog stew out of Denver because they played at their highest level. So it's about players, it's not about a scheme. All right, attack problems, not people. That's really, really important because, again, we all want to succeed. We're all hyper-competitive. 
And the tendency is when there is someone that clearly makes a mistake, you attack the players. Here's the reality of it. We say this. Attack problems, not people. We define a problem. What is a problem? Define things for your football team. When we have our first meeting, we talk about it. I talk about it to our kids. Guys, here's what a problem is to me. A problem is anything that keeps us from playing at the highest level. Anything. Anything that keeps us from playing at the highest level. And if, it, if we can find it, we're going to attack it. And we're going to rid it. We're going to try and get it out of our program. All right? So again, it could be an attitude problem, it could be a scheme problem, it could be a facility problem, it could be a talent problem, but if those things are there, we're going to attack those things. But we're never going to attack a person. Never. Because if you want your kids to quit on you, the fastest way to get them to do that is to attack them as human beings. Have respect for everybody in the program. Right. People have an incredibly high tolerance for praise. You hear everybody talk about a guy's pain tolerance. How much he can suffer and still go out and play the game. Here's the reality of us as human beings. We have an incredibly high tolerance for praise. Find something good in every player every day. You want them to come back. How many guys have problems with retention? I know your problem. I know your problems because I was here. I lived in this country. I told you uh, GFL football. I understand. I'm not some guy that they flew in here that has no idea what goes on on the ground over here. I know the issues. Retention is one. Well, how do you get kids to come back? Say something good about them every day. Find something good in what they did today. Even if all it is is they came to practice, if you want them to come back, if you want them to bring somebody else, because we all need more players. Anybody got enough players? None of us do. Right? None of us do. We don't have enough players. Right? And as a game, as, as all of us who love this game, we need more kids playing. We need more volunteers. We need more mothers. We need more of everything. Well, the only way to get people to come back and the only way to encourage others to come is make it something special for them. And the number one thing we all want to feel special is what? Us. Okay? So find something good in every player every day and then tell them. Don't be afraid to talk to your players. And most of the conversations should be about something other than football. And again, guys, I'm telling you, that's the way we treat them in pro football. And pro football is a mean, mean, nasty, ugly business. They come and they go. That seat's empty today. It was full with somebody yesterday. And there'll be another person in it tomorrow. That's my world. But as long as there's somebody sitting in that seat, it's my responsibility to treat that guy with respect and find something good about what he does every day until somebody else does it. Right? Everyone in the organization has value to the organization. Everyone in the organization has value to the organization. Anybody know who Bill Walsh is? Bill Walsh was the architect of those great 49er teams. I had an opportunity to sit with him when he was working for NFL Europe. I said, Mr. Walsh, what was it that was so unique that you would take guys like Jesse Cipolo and, and got Joe Montana, guys that were not quote, NFL caliber guys and win championships with them. And he said it be simple. They look for the same thing in everybody in the organization. That they were committed and that they would do all they could to the organization. Alright? And what they found out was whether it was the guy that, that parked cars or it was the guy that sold tickets at the stadium or, or their starting center, everybody had a value. And they, they rewarded everybody for their value. There's nobody in your organization that, that is no value to you, or they shouldn't be in your organization. All right? So find the good in everybody and then find a place for it. Must establish powerful lines of communication at every level of the organization. Communication. What is required of communication? Listening is the number one requirement of powerful communication. Not speaking, listening. And powerful communication is the kind of communication where you can come to me if you got a problem with me, or you got a problem with something I did, and you can sit down and we can talk about it, man to man, man to woman, whoever. Had this incident this year. I stepped over the line with our punter. I lost my cool in the meeting, and I attacked the person. I didn't attack the problem. 
And Doug wanted if three of our guys didn't come right to my meeting, after, right, right to my office afterwards and say, Jeff, uh-uh. You told us you were going to attack problems, not people. You attacked the person today. That's powerful communication. I needed that because I had stepped over the line. All right? And I'm proud of our guys that they would have the guts or, the, or they would feel comfortable enough to be able to come to me with something like that. I didn't take it as an attack. All right, let's talk about building a team. You want to win? You want to win? Listen to Lee Rowland. You want to win? Listen to Coach Nielsen. You want to win? Because all the schemes are here today. But I will tell you, these things transcend the scheme. These things every great football team has. Every championship team I've ever been on, and I've been on a bunch of them, have these things. Number one. First and foremost, you must be a tough football team. Jim Young, who was the head coach at Army, when we played him in the Mirage Bowl, and they, had, they had four guys, you can imagine this, running the wishbone, they had four backs, the quarterback and the three running backs all had over 100 yards that day. Not pretty. Not pretty. Matter of fact, our defensive tackle got run over so many times that at the end of the game, if he drank water, I thought it was spurted out of his chest with so many holes in it. But here's what it said. You've got to be a tough football team. If you're a tough football team, you'll always have a chance. I didn't say you had to be a talented football team. I said you had to be a tough football team. All right? Now let's define that because, again, tough is one of those words that, that needs a little just defining. All right. Truly tough football teams play up to their physical ability or, and or beyond their physical ability every time they go out on, on the field. The, take a toughness test with your team. Be brutally honest with yourself because that's the only way you're going to get better. Right? Self-evaluation. We spend an entire, we spend months in the off-season doing it. Looking at every single play, every single situation, every single scenario in the, in the previous year. Right? One of the things you've got to find is how did your team play? Do they go out there every week and do they play up to their ability or beyond? If they are, you're a tough football team. Number two, true toughness must be ingrained in people, right? It's got to be ingrained in a player's personal profile. Now, let's, again, I'm not talking about being an asshole, okay? I'm talking about hitting guys late, right? I'm not talking about any of those. I never once mentioned that. I'm talking about toughness, the kind of toughness that really, really matters. How many, of you, how many guys are your fathers? Raise your hand. How many of you guys see your child, children born? You think your wife ain't tough? Huh? That's toughness. That's toughness. Because think about it, would you do that? Would you allow that to happen to you? She's committed, right? So again, that's the kind, we're talking about real true toughness. All right, performance indicators of true toughness. These are the things, if you're tough, these are the things that you'll do. Number one, are you passionate about wanting to be successful? Guys, I wish the one thing I could give to European coaches, the one blessing I wish I could concur on all of them, and you all got to do it within your own personalities. But I wish I could get you to coach with passion. Right? And passion's not screaming and yelling. But passion is when that player comes on the field, he knows the coach is ready to coach me today. He's excited about seeing me get better today. That's hard. God dang, it's hard. Because we all get tired, we all got other jobs, we all, there's a lot of reasons. But you know what? They got a lot of reasons why they, they don't need to be there. But bring your passion to the game. Two, how do you run the football? Now, I've been on some great passing teams, but we always have the ability to run the football. If you can't run the football, you're not tough. I don't care what anybody says. You're not tough. And then conversely on defense, if you stop the run, if you can't stop the run, you're not, you're not physically tough enough. So you got to make sure you get those things done. But uh, how well do you play when you're in the lead? How well do you play when you're behind? Why is it important? How, how, do, you, how do you demonstrate your toughness when you're playing in the lead? What do you do? You put your boot, you put your boot on your throat. That's it. Killer instinct that you want. Do you have that? Does your football team have that? If they don't, they're not mentally tough enough. 
Number two, how well do they play? How well do you play when you're behind? All right. Do you consistently make good choices, particularly when no one is watching or when you're in a pressurized environment? True toughness is a matter of choice. The greatest power we have as human beings is the power to choose. No question about that. Our ability to choose what we what we want. Right? By doing so, you build a toughness in your collect, excuse me. By doing so, you build true toughness into your personal team profile. I'm going to tell you something. I say this to our kids. It's pro football. It's pro football business. And you know what? I want to see every one of those guys that walks out of our meeting room or walks out of our interaction or walks away from our team or gets cut in three weeks or whatever. Every, for every time they step into our room, I want to see them be a better person. A better football player, but ultimately a better person because they're going to play football this long in their life. And in our world that we live in today, where, where so many kids don't have a dad, for most of us, or for some of us, I know most of us in our world, in the demographic that I have, I am the only male role model, a coach is the only male role model that they have. That's a big ass responsibility. And I want them to be better people when, when they leave us. Right? Foster self-discipline within the team profile. We're going to talk about discipline. Discipline is the act of continually holding you and others responsible to a stated objective. Right? Discipline is not how you cut your hair or whether you stand on the line or whether you hold your head, your helmet on your head. Those are all trappings of discipline. Let's talk about true discipline because it's all that matters. The tra discipline trains your mind to do only the things that help you move toward being a better player in person. There's that word again. Player in person. Right? Because I truly believe if we work together to help a player become a better disciplined individual, a better self-disciplined individual, when he leaves the game, he'll be a better person, he'll be a better dad, he'll be a better husband, he'll be a better citizen in the world. That's our job. We all share it. Right? Whether that youth kid plays till he's 17 or if he's an NFL player, or my player, he plays till he's 27. The more internalized your discipline, the less ongoing maintenance required by coaches. We did not have a curfew ever this year. Not on our football team. Never had a curfew. Great cup game, we're going to the championship game, we don't have a curfew. Never had one problem. Never had one incident. Why? Because we talked about these things. Right? And we had a well-disciplined football team. Self-discipline is the most critical of all the types of discipline. Okay. All right, let me get through this. Here's some positive results of improved self-discipline. Number one, you'll be better conditioned. Right? Your players will work in the off-season. That will allow you to work at a better tempo. Number two, you'll have better finish because when you're better conditioned, you outlast your opponent and win in the fourth quarter. That's a product of the discipline you have in your football team, not the scheme that you run. Right? Better quickness because you discipline better explosive movements. Better fundamentals because you discipline better concentration on the details of one member. Better scheme execution because you're better listening, better learning, and better study habits. And you'll be a better person because self-discipline permeates your per personal profile. All right, we have to be fundamentally sound. Not enough is done in the fundamentals. Worst tackling in football is where? At the highest level, it's in the National Football League. Right? Best fundamental team won on Saturday, on Sunday. Best fundamental team in the NFL won the championship. Coincidence? No. It's an outgrowth of what they do. Pete Carroll's been at it for four years. They work fundamentals. You must teach the fundamentals. I love this one. Fundamentals allow you to compete against the best players and dominate the average and below average team. Fundamental improvement is, shared by, is a shared responsibility on a football team. You have to learn to practice together. You have to learn to practice together. There's a saying in Chinese, gung ho. Has anybody heard it? You know what that means? Working together in harmony. Right? Gung ho. Working together in harmony. It is the ultimate state of practice. We fight each day to try and get a little bit better at that. Uh, reasons why players' fundamentals do not improve. You resist being coached. The tempo in your drills is not fast enough. Guys, the ultimate level of fundamentals in 
this game, in every, in every area of, of, I don't care what you do, is what's called unconscious competence. Where I don't have to think about where I put my hand, or, or what I take a six inch step, or what my base needs to be. It happens because I've done it so many times. Do you know how many, you know how many repetitions it takes to create a habit? One million, that's what they say. One, anybody read the Tiffany Point read the book, great book. One million, have, one million repetitions to create a habit. What does that mean to you as a coach? That should, it should, right now you should think of it. It means I can't have 58 drills. I gotta have a few things that pertain exactly to what I'm asking the kid to do, and we gotta do it over and over and over and over. Anybody still want to study martial arts? All right, greatest, greatest Japanese, uh, Okinawan karate expert was a guy named Kichin Fuyakoshi, right? He was a, the greatest of all time, they say. In an interview I saw one time, they asked him how long, how long he's been training. He said, it took me 35 years to do the front punch. The front punch is the one single most fundamental punch in karate. 38 years it took you to understand it. You think you're going to get your kids to master whatever it is, the fundamental that you're trying to teach? If you're going to this drill, and this drill, and this drill, and this drill, find, define the drill to do them. Excuse me, folks, i got to do this. Player has the max out of physical ability. That's very rare. Right, coach's role is to correct immediately player, player's errors. Players must trust their coaches. You build the trust. You build the trust. And how do you build trust? You commit to something very difficult. You work at it every day. Just like your marriage. Just like your marriage. <laughs> Sorry. All right, guys. These things are not only your responsibility. I love this one. This was Coach's greatest one. And he said it to his staff when I was there in St. Louis, and he said it to his staff when we were there in Kansas City. Fella, it's not our job, it's our obligation. There's a big difference. You owe it to every kid who comes on your practice field and straps on that helmet. Every single one of them. The best one and the worst one. We have a responsibility and obligation to those kids. Think about your time. Those of us who have the opportunity to play this game, you can't go back. Once it's over, this game is over. This is not tennis. This is not soccer. You can go play soccer on the street corner until you're 90. I have yet to go to the beach and see guys coming to kick off. This game is a finite game. There's this, there's this much in our lives, right? There's special guys who play the game. Every single one of them is a special person because they're choosing a very difficult game. They're choosing a very physical game. They're choosing a game that isn't easy to practice or fun to practice in some cases. So you've got to love them, and it's your obligation to get them to be the best that you can be. I will be here always. I want you to come get me. I'll be in that room. We'll talk anything you want to talk. This is your week, not mine. Thank you.